Hi everyone. Today's lecture is going to be on Heinz Eisler and natural forms for shells. I'm standing in the lobby of Friends Center at Princeton University, and behind me are two models representing Heinz Eisler's designs. These two models I'm going to cover in today's lecture. And these models were part of an exhibition that traveled to several museums, including Princeton University Art Museum and the Carnegie Museum of Art. So my goals for today's lecture are to know who and what were stimulus to Eisler's creativity. Second, what were the two form-finding methods that Eisler favored? Third, describe his process of construction that made his shells feasible and affordable. And finally, look at some of his significant structures, like his bread and butter pneumatic form, the outdoor theater in Grotzingen, Sickly Building, and the Heimberg Tennis Center. Let's start the lecture by looking at Isler's debut into the profession, and that was in 1959 in Madrid at the International Association for Shell and Spatial Structures Colloquium, organized by Eduardo Toroja, the Spaniard that we've already studied through the Spanish shells. At this colloquium, Isler showed up and he was the last one to present a paper, and his presentation really caused a lot of discussion. His paper was about one page in length, and it had many illustrations, including one that demonstrated many forms that were possible for shells. His presentation brought about a rash of discussion with very many famous engineers, such as Toroja who was present, Overa, and many others. The written notes on the discussion was about five times longer than the actual paper. Most people at first didn't really understand what he was talking about. He had to defend himself to these best designers in the world because they didn't believe that he could build these things that he was explaining. As a colleague, Eckhart Ram said, quote, the discussion reflects typical situation between generations. The established, experienced designers, reluctant, having several concerns, versus the young, emerging, enthusiastic engineer with a lot of new ideas. 20 years later, Isler attended the same IASS conference as a special invited speaker, along with Felix Candela, whom we've also already studied. By this time, Isler had designed over a thousand shells, many in the futuristic forms that he indicated in that sketch in 1959. Who and what were a stimulus to Isler's creativity? We're gonna look at a few answers to that question. First, let's look at his teacher, Pierre Lardy, and the influence that he had on Isler. Pierre Lardy was someone who gave lectures on the rigorous side of structural engineering, but he combined that with the idea that once you understood structures, you could begin to play with the form without getting outside of that discipline. This is the idea of discipline and play, the idea that you can be creative in your designs and finding forms, but you stay within the constraints of the engineering discipline, the constraints of physics, for example. And we are learning that these constraints don't constrain that creativity. It actually stimulates them. So within this boundary of discipline and play, Pierre Lardy taught his lectures, again, through the hardcore technical learning of engineering, but also demonstrating the aesthetics and the importance of aesthetics. When asked to reflect about his teacher, Lardy, Isler said this, quote, I think that the most important contribution we students got from our teacher is this. He reminded us, the engineering students, A, that we have in us a sense for aesthetics, B, that we have the right to use it, C, that we are allowed to mention our opinion, and D, that we can find and express it in our projects. This, to my opinion, was the invaluable, great, and unique contribution that he gave to us. Not the statics, not the theories, not the investigations were his greatest and lasting influence, but encouraging us to find and apply aesthetics from within us. And for this, I am very grateful to him. Pierre Lardy had a models lab, an idea he got from Eduardo Toroja, and Isler also had a models lab. In this image, you see Isler in his lab with many structural models, which he tested for stresses and deflections before building the full-scale structure. The next stimulus to Isler that I'm going to talk about are forms from, quote, natural processes. Isler was very inspired by nature and all that he saw around him. First, I'm going to describe the pneumatic forms, and then I'm going to describe the hanging forms, again, ideas he obtained from nature. The pneumatic forms were his bread and butter. This is what kept his company in business, in other words. 
and he got this idea from the pillow. He had been working on a barrel-shaped design, went to bed very late one night, was very tired, and he saw his pillow, and he had, in essence, a light bulb that went off in his head. He had the idea of taking a membrane and inflating it and finding the form for shells through that process of an inflated membrane. He used a bicycle tire pump to pump that membrane and the pressure of that membrane very closely simulated the opposite pressure of gravity. And that was the idea of the new forms he would find for these concrete shells. If we reflect back to the German study of Dischinger and Finsterwalder, recall that we talked about the struggle of finding square forms for shell structures. And in this image, we see one of Dischinger's domes with many men load testing that form. This is a form taken from a sphere where large rigid beams on the four perimeters needed to be designed to keep this structure stable. On the other hand, with the inflated membrane forms, the square shape came naturally to Eastler's shells. To make this structure in equilibrium, he had to use pre-stressing ties up at the top on the four-sided perimeter. And in this way, he had a square plan that was, again, structurally stable and in equilibrium. Eastler, after designing every shell, would climb on the shell, look for cracks, measure deflections. So it wasn't just about designing the structure in the office with numbers and a pencil and paper. It was also about thinking about the construction process and observing the structures for many years following the completion of that construction. Eastler was a designer, but he did not have a construction business like Felix Candela, for example. He developed a procedure for building the shells and then trained a local contractor. So again, Eastler was thinking about his designs, but also thinking about the construction process and very intimately involved in that construction process and thinking about how to make it economical. So for example, the way he made it economical was to reuse many times the laminated wooden arches that you see in this image where Eastler is standing beside them. These wooden arches were placed on a light metal scaffold and then wooden slats and fiber boards were placed on top of that. These fiber boards are left in place once the concrete hardens, and there's mechanical connections between that fiber board and the concrete so they can act monolithically. The idea for these fiber boards is to permanently leave them in place for insulation. One of the challenges to thin shell concrete structures, in particular in Switzerland, where you have very cold, harsh environment, are the thermal gradients that run through the thickness of that shell. Those thermal gradients can cause cracking. If you have cold on one surface and hot on the bottom surface, the indoor space would be warmer than the outdoor space. That causes strains that differ and it could cause cracking in that concrete shell. By leaving that fiber board in place, you can have a more uniform distribution of temperatures through that concrete and therefore avoid cracking. While such pneumatic forms were important to Eastler and a trademark of his creative approach to design, there was one important aesthetic detail about them that he wanted to improve. Find out what that is in the next segment.